and welcome to the God's Words Bible Study, and we will start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do, and we pray, Lord, that as we look into your word, that you will teach us, and when you have taught us, that we will have the courage and the strength to do as you have commanded. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray. Amen. Okay, so today we are going to look at a very controversial topic, and it is once saved, always saved. And to start out, let us go to two of the verses that are normally used to support the concept that once you have accepted Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you do after that, you are saved, you'll go to heaven. The first one is Mark 13 and verse 22. And that reads, For false Christ and false prophets shall arise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. So it says that what? False Christ and false prophets will arise to seduce, to trick, to trip up, if it were possible, even the elect. And they say, see, the same, which is the elect, cannot be seduced by the devil. Well, actually, well, there's two things that we need to look at in that verse. The first thing is, it says, the elect. Remember, there's a verse that says that you're supposed to make your calling and election sure. So the elect are those who have heeded the call and are elect by God for salvation. These people are the people who are 100% committed and for them, yeah, the devil can't trick them. But let, let us look at the entire verse. Because sometimes we like to stop these verses halfway through. Let's look at what it says in Matthew 24, verse 24. And it says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, that's verbatim what Mark said. That if it were possible, these false Christs and false prophets would deceive the elect. But notice what Christ says here in 25. Behold, I have told you before. Therefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the light cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcasses, there the eagles will be gathered together. What Christ is saying is that it will not be possible for the elect to be deceived by the devil because Christ has already given them the antidote for this deception. And the antidote is, don't go. If you hear that he's, Christ is here, don't go. If you hear that Christ is there, don't go. Now, what happens if one of the elect goes ahead and go where they hear that this Christ is? They're in rebellion. They're in rebellion. That's one, because Christ told them not to. Two, they're on the devil's ground. It's a one-two punch. In rebellion, on the devil's ground, you lose. You will be deceived, and you won't even know it. So that you will become one of them of whom Christ says, they will kill you thinking that they do God a service. Okay? So that's the first thing, is that when it talks about it being impossible for the elect to be deceived, it's not talking about everybody. It's just talking about those who are completely committed to Jesus Christ, the elect. Okay. The second place where we'll see people normally run to whenever they discuss this is in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and way down to the bottom of the last part of this great chapter, it says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's true. There is nothing on earth or in heaven or under the earth or in hell that can separate the Christian from the love of God. Nothing. Now get this, and I know some pastors won't like this because they preach about it all the time, but get this, nothing outside of you. So that's what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying here that there is no force on the face of the earth that can come between you and God, except you. And that is what I'm going to prove today. That's not my proof text, I'm just telling you what it said. That they use this and they say, nothing, that includes you. Excuse me? That, have you read the Bible? If that was the case, then Adam and Eve could not have sinned. Exactly, because Adam and Eve were saved, weren't they? Children of God went astray, lost their salvation, lost their dominion, lost the world, lost their progenity. But what happened? God, in his infinite mercy, has found a way, has opened a way whereby we can be saved. But let us look now, and we're gonna, what we're going to do first is that we're going to go to our character study to see a man called of God who was saved, and we're going to look at the description of his calling, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to see that everything that the Bible says about this particular man is true of the Christian. It's exactly how they describe the Christian. So there's no doubt that this man was saved. Then we will look again and we will see that there is no doubt that this man was lost. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to 1 Samuel chapter 10 and start at verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it out upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord had anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelda. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father has left the care of the asses and sorrow it for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God, to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them. And they shall prophesy, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Okay, so let's go back. And look at what is happening here. In verse 1 it says, Then Samuel, and this is the anointing of Saul, the anointing of King Saul. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head. Now let us jump over to 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 30. And let us see what it means when a vial of oil is poured upon someone's head. This is called an anointing. Let us see what it means and what exactly takes place. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Okay, so when Samuel anointed David with the oil, what happened to him? The Spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. And the very same thing is happening here in verse 1 of chapter 10 with Saul. And I'll show you as we go along so that there is no doubt. But it say here that he was what? He was anointed with oil 
which was poured on his head. And this oil, everywhere where it applies in the Bible, it signifies the Holy Spirit. For example, when Aaron was anointed and when Christ was anointed, it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit and it always brings with it that anointing, that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But let's move on. Let's jump down to verse 6 and let's see what it says there. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Okay, so there are three things happening in this verse. First, the Spirit of God will come upon thee. Second, thou shalt prophesy with them. And third, thou shalt be turned into another man. All three of these are a description of the born again experience. So the verse that we're looking at, which is 1 Samuel 10 verse 6, says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And to understand that, we're going to look at a few verses, the first of which is Acts 10, 44 to 48. Go on. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Okay, so this, if you remember, this is where Cornelius, the centurion, sent for Peter because he was in prayer and the, the Lord God Almighty told him to send to Joppa for Peter because Peter was going to explain some stuff to him. So Peter goes to him and once Peter started to preach, the Holy Spirit did what? Fell upon them. Fell upon them. And what happened? And they were speaking in tongues. They speak in tongues. And magnified God. Okay, they spoke in tongues and magnifying God. If this was written in the Old Testament, what it would have said is that the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they prophesied. prophesied. Okay, let's look at another verse because we kind of understand what this verse is saying that we are studying. 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. And here in the first Samuel 10 or 6, it says that, And thou shalt be turned into another man. Turned into another man. Let's look at Colossians 3 verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Okay, so what happened with the new man? He become a new man. He become a new man because now he is in the image of the one who created him. Created. So he's just like God. You can only be like God if you are born again. That's what Christ taught Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Let's jump over to Ephesians 4, verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay, so the new man is created by God in righteousness and holiness. Hold on, you skip over. True holiness. And true holiness, not the false concocted holiness that some of us walk around with, but in true holiness. So the new man is in the image of God and is also created in righteousness and true holiness and in the verse that we are looking at Saul was told he would be turned into another man he would no longer be the same man that he was okay but let us go on first Samuel 10 and we'll start at verse 7 so we're continuing the same passage and we're going to stick with this passage for a little while and let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Okay, hold on. For God is with thee. He is now walking with God. From this point on, God is with him. With him. Go on. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee, 
to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Okay, so in verse 9 it said, God gave him another heart. Another heart. A ah, new heart. A new heart. Isn't that right? Isn't so this again is a description of the born Christian, again. the born again child of God. So let's look at Ezekiel 11, verse 19 to 20. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Okay, so the new heart that God gives us is actually what we know today as the new covenant. This is a description of the new covenant. The new covenant, God says that I, I make a new covenant with you and I will give you a new heart. Okay, Ezekiel 36 verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay, good. So here we see again that the new heart is what? The new covenant is born again experience. You no longer have that old heart of flesh which is prone to wickedness, but now you have a new heart which is prone to righteousness. And so we see that when Samuel told Saul that when he turned his back to go from Saul, God gave him another heart, a new heart. He is now a new creature. Okay, continue from verse 10. Some people might, before you continue, some people might say, well, that's Old Testament. Um, is there nothing in the New Testament that you could tell us? What do you suggest? Well, if you look oh. at Romans 6. Okay, go ahead. Okay, while my wife is looking for the exact verse, let me read something for you from Jeremiah 31, start at verse 31. And this is a description of what we know today as the New Covenant, the New Testament. And here's what it says, Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not all according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But it shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, say the Lord. I will put my law in their inward part and write them in their heart and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, say the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Okay, so that was Jeremiah 31, verse 31, continuing on to 34, and the verse you're going to read. In Romans 6 and verse 3 and 4, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, Dead by the glory of his Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, very good. So what we're looking here described in First Samuel, which is one of the earliest book in the Old Testament, is telling us about the born again experience and is describing to us in detail someone going through that experience. So continuing in First Samuel chapter ten, 10 verse ten. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, 
is Saul also among the prophets. And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. Okay. And now, as we mentioned earlier, the act of prophesying is in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where whenever the Spirit of God came upon any of these people, the outward sign was that they prophesied, that they spake in tongues. tongues. And magnified okay. God. And they glorified or magnified God. All right. But let, we're not stopping there. So no. Saul is what? Saul is a new man. He's a new man. He's a safe person. In today's language, we'll call him a Christian. Born again Christian. Okay? Okay. So by now, I hope that you have seen that by all indication, by all definition of the word, that Saul was a Christian. He has been born again. He has been given a new heart. He has the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he is a new creature. In Christ but I want to just delve a little deeper into Saul because Saul shows a pattern that we have to begin to recognize because we think that if someone comes to Christ and then leaves Christ that they go back to where they were before and that is not right as Jesus put it the last state of the man is worse than at the first so let's look at Saul and we're gonna see Saul before his conversion Saul during the time when God was with him and Saul after he lost his salvation okay so let's start Saul when he was told by Samuel that he was gonna be the first king of Israel his reaction was not yeah thought you guys would never ask I've been waiting for this all my life no 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 what he in fact said was that hey listen I, you got the wrong guy because I am of the smallest tribe in Israel and my family is the least in that tribe. Boy, have you picked the wrong guy. In fact, he was so unsure of himself that on the day of his inauguration, instead of coming up and strolling to the front of the crowd and receiving the crown, you know what he did? He hid. Yes, Saul went and he hid behind the stuff. And in fact, God had to tell the prophet that, hey, Saul is over there hiding behind the stuff and they went and got him and inaugurated him as the first king because he was so unsure of himself and as a matter of fact not only was Saul unsure of himself there were some people at his inauguration that wasn't too sure of him either and these people said what shall we have Saul to reign over us but the Bible says when Saul heard these things he did what he held his peace he didn't say anything he didn't retaliate he just let it roll off his back like water off a duck's back later on the enemies of Israel attacked and the Bible says that when Saul heard this his anger was kindled and why was his anger kindled because the Spirit of God came upon him so the Spirit of God came into Saul and Saul was angry but he wasn't angry in a sinful way as the Bible says you can be angry but not sin so this was righteous anger and so Saul called all of Israel together and he went out and he whooped the enemy and when he came back, the people said, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over him? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. And do you know what Saul said? Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the God has wrought salvation in Israel. So you see here that Saul is very magnanimous, he's very open hearted, he's very forgiven, he's very accepting. Because he was a saved man. Saul was at peace with himself and at peace with everyone around him. Unfortunately, just one year later, well, two years later, things were about to change. The enemy were again at the gates. And Israel followed Saul trembling. They were afraid. And Samuel told Saul, hey, listen, tarry, wait seven days and I'm going to come and I'm going to offer the sacrifice and then you're going to go to war. But Samuel was a little bit late and so Saul, seeing all the people trembling and, you know, sneaking off and going to hide in the rocks, decided to offer a sacrifice. And as usual, as soon as he did it, guess what? Samuel showed up and Samuel said, hey, what have you done? And Saul said, listen, I saw that the people were scattered from me and thou camest not on the day appointed. And he said, I forced myself and offered a bird sacrifice. 
And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now the Lord would have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. So God already is looking at it, and God is not pleased. And Samuel says, God has sought for a man after his own heart. A man who, when the chips are down, he wait upon the Lord. He doesn't forge ahead. Because what we have to understand is that a king offering sacrifices instead of going through the priesthood or going through the prophets is a big no-no. Because we see when Uzziah, Uzziah was a very good king of Israel and he did everything that was right in the sight of the Lord. But the Bible says, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction and he went into the temple to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And the priest came in and the priest said, hey, hey, what are you doing here? And the Bible says that Uzziah was angry. And as he was angry and confronting the priest, you know what happened? Leprosy just broke out on him. And he died a leper. So the king usurper in the position of the priest is a big no-no. But anyway, God said through Samuel at that time to Saul that, listen, you're already in trouble because you're not following God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. But a little later on, God turned around and God says, Okay, listen, when Israel was in the Exodus, Amalek would ambush the weakest, the people at the back, and would kill them. And God had sworn at that time that he would blot out Amalek from under the, the face of the sun. That Amalek name would no longer be remembered. And so he told Saul, Go and destroy Amalek. Attack them. And this is what he said. And utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And so Saul went to war against the Amalek. But Saul did not follow the word of God. In verse 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 15 it says, But Saul and the people spared Agog. And the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. And so they are now coming back from their big victory, and Samuel went to Saul, and, and Saul says, Hey, blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, Then what means this bleeping of sheep in my ear, and the lowing of ox which I hear? And Saul say, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now he's saying that we obeyed the command of God. God didn't tell them to save the best for me. He said, Destroy everything. And I want you to remember this because we're going to come back to this. So Samuel said to Saul, <laughs> it's kind of funny, because once he saw that he was wrong and that he was in trouble, the first thing he did was that he blamed the people. He said, but the people took off the spoil. You remember Adam and Eve? Yes, yeah, the same thing. Weak men always blame those who are under their authority. And at that point, Samuel pronounced that God had rejected Saul from being king. Because the Lord does not have as much delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obedience. Remember that. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your tithe and offering. What he needs is your integrity. What he needs is your obedience. What he needs is your loyalty. Okay? But it's kind of funny because when Saul heard that, he said in verse 25, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And we would think here that what is happening is that Saul is repentant and he's confessing. But no, 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 no. If we jump down to verse 30, we will see what his true motive was. And there he says, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord my God. So he's not really repentant. He is more concerned about his status. You see that? Remember when he got inaugurated? He was so unsure of himself. He thought that he wasn't, wasn't deservant. Now... His only concern 
is his status in the eyes of the people. He's not even concerned about the fact that God has rejected him from being king. And in the very next chapter, this is right after David was anointed and the Spirit came upon David. The, the Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So remember when he was anointed, the Spirit of God came upon him and gave him a new heart and made him a new man. Now the Spirit of the Lord is departing from him and an evil spirit comes and dwells in him. And we know that the Spirit that dwells in you shows whether or not you are lost or saved. If you are saved, then you are the temple of the Lord. The Spirit of God dwells in you. But if you are not, then your true master takes up residence, which is Satan, an evil spirit. So we looked at it and we saw where Saul was converted, where he was serving God. And now we see where God has left him, God has rejected him, the Spirit of God has left him, and an evil spirit is coming into him. And so right after this, he met David, and David, of course, fought Goliath and killed Goliath. And you now David is one of his main men. David is going out, he's fighting battle, he's coming home. But then one day when David was returning and Saul, the woman came out and the woman started singing. And the woman said, Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. And Saul was very angry and he says, what? They're ascribing to me thousand, but under David ten thousands? What more is he going to do but except take the kingdom? And the Bible says, and Saul eyed David from that day forward. So now he is jealous of David and jealousy is not a fruit of the spirit and the bible says no catch this saul is now going to spend the rest of his life fighting against david and why is he fighting against david why is he trying to kill david let's look at first samuel 18 verse 28 and saul saw and knew that the lord was with david what saul saw and knew that the lord was with david and verse 29, And Saul was yet the more afraid of David and became David's enemy continually. Why is he David's enemy? Because David is with God. You get that? So we could easily say, and we would be totally correct, that from that day forward, Saul became God's enemy continually. Now catch this. Let's jump back to 28. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And this is so messed up, folks. This is so messed up. Saul had his daughter, Michal, marry David. And do you know why he allowed her to marry David? He let her marry David because he thought that if she married David, she would be a snare and a trap for David. That she is such a bad person that it would mess David up. Isn't that, isn't that sinister? That is so sinister. And so Saul is now trying to kill David. And a couple of times David had a chance to kill Saul and he wouldn't touch him. He wouldn't harm him. And each time David pointed out to Saul that, hey, listen, I had a chance to kill you and I didn't. I didn't touch you. I didn't harm you. And each time Saul says, David, my son, my son, I'm so sorry. Listen, let's forget all of this. I I'm wrong. Forgive me. Let's start over. But each time he did that. It was temporary because he went right back to trying to kill David again. And so the last time David was in this company of Saul, David realized that, listen, I'm not going to make it because there's but a step between me and death. So I'm going to have to get out of here. And so David, with the blessing of Jonathan, Saul's son, decided to flee Israel. And on his way out, he stopped at the temple of God, well, at that time the tabernacle of God, and he asked the priest if he had any food and a weapon. And so this, the priest said, the only thing that I have there is a shoe bread, which he gave David some, and Goliath's sword, which he gave to David. There was a guy at the tabernacle that day named Doeg, um, an Edomite. And he saw what happened and he went back and told Saul and Saul got angry with the priest. And he called the priest in and said, what? You have now teamed up against me with my enemies. The priest says, no, what are you talking about? David is your best man. He's your most loyal servant and he came and he needed some stuff so we gave it to him because he's your man. And Saul was so angry with the priests for helping David that he told his servants to kill all the priests that were there that day. And there were 85 priests there that day and all of Saul's servants refused to move. They wouldn't touch the priests. 
But he told this little scoundrel named Doeg, and Doeg fell upon the priest, meaning that he jumped on them with his sword and he slew all 85 of them. But not only did he slay 85 priests, he went to Nob, the city of the priests, and this is what it says in verse 19. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and suckling, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Now remember I told you I would come back to this. When God had told Saul to destroy all the Amalekites, right? All the women, all the men, all the sheep, all the oxen, kill everything. You remember what Saul did? He spared some. But now when he attacked God's people, what did he do? He killed everything because Saul is no longer a safe person. Saul is evil. And from that point on, Saul was a dead man walking. But what happened with Saul? After Saul disobeyed, God rejected him outright. And the Bible tells us that God never spoke another word to him. No matter how much he cried, no matter how much he inquired at the prophet or at the Urim or Churim, God never once, after Saul was rejected, spoke another word to him. And the last act that Saul did before he died was to consult with a witch, reprehensible in the sight of God. So Saul, as far as we can tell, never made it. There is nothing in the Bible that indicates, that hints that Saul made it. Yet still, he was a saved man. And one of the things that the, the Bible tells us about Saul is that the Spirit of God left him. First Samuel chapter 13. Why my wife is looking for the verse where the Spirit of God left Saul, let me read First Chronicles 28 verse 5. And David says, And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord our God. And he said unto me, Solomon, now this is God saying to David, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my court. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. That description again is a description of the born again person. To those who believe, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So God is telling David that Solomon will be what? Will be his son, God's son, and God will be his father. But God goes on, moreover I will establish his kingdom forever if he be constant to do my commandment. Now mark you, God said that he will be his son. But now here's God putting a condition because some of us think that salvation carries no condition. Here's God putting a condition. If he be constant to do my commandment and my judgment as at this day, now therefore in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye shall possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children after you forever. Now David, go church back in, and says, And thou, Solomon my son, know thou the Lord, know thou the God of thy fathers, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searches all heart and understands all the imaginations of the thought. If you seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now mark you, forever is mentioned twice. He will be God's son and God will be his father and he will establish his kingdom forever. forever. Now here now David say, okay, that's what God said. Now let me warn you, my son. If you forsake God, he will cast you off forever. forever. Now David is saying, Solomon, you're in. But don't think that just because you're in, you can't get out. He said, once saved Solomon, it's not always saved. Once a man of God is not always a man of God. If you turn your back on him, he will turn his back on you. If you forsake him, he will kick you out of heaven. Get that? He will blot your name out of the book of life, as God and, and Moses once discussed. We found that verse you were looking for? No, it, the chapter just describes the conditions under which Saul 
lost the kingdom of um, Israel. He, the kingship was taken away from him because of his disobedience. And, oh, okay. So and God said that He rejects him. I'll find it and I'll put it in the on the screen. On the screen, okay. So you'll be able to see that. So, but let's go on. Hebrews six verse four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they just crucify it to themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Okay, most of the pastors I hear who deal with this text, here's what they do. They say that this is impossible because when it says in verse 6, if they shall fall away, that can't happen because the elect can be separated from God per Romans chapter 8, which we went over already. You see, you see the fallacy of this argument? They're saying that Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is warning Christians about something that's impossible. Have you ever heard anything so... Because <sighs> the verse is saying that once, they were once enlightened, so and they were partakers of the heavenly gift and the Holy Ghost, so they were saved. And having it, tasted the good word of God and powers of the world, if they fall away. So the, the, there's an implication that they can fall away in the right. text. Right, right. But when the pastors deal with it, they say they can't. And so they're saying that God... So they're negating the word of God. Yeah, they're saying that Paul is warning something, Christians, about something that's impossible. Folks, if you find anything in the Bible that God is warning about something that can't happen, show it to me. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Because what the pastors want you to do is to feel good, about good and safe in your sin so that you keep coming to their church and keep giving them your money. That's all they care about. You don't believe me? Go read where Paul says that all they want to do, talking about these people coming into the church, he says all they want to do is to boast in your flesh. Remember he said that? He said, no, they're just using you for their own profit so that they feel good about yourself so they can fleece you. Fleece me that they're going to strip you of every dime you have. Let, let me just get back to the text. He says that what? It is impossible. Now, God is telling you something that's impossible. We think that it's impossible that once you get saved, that you get lost. Now, Paul is saying, telling you something that's impossible. He's saying that when you got saved and then go back to Satan, it's impossible to, for you to come to God. Now, this just occurred to me while I was saying this. Let me explain where this is coming from. There is an analogy that God gave us about marriage. And what he says about marriage is that if the wife or the husband, is, well, if a, if, if a couple is married and they get divorced, they can always remarry. Except if one of them marry someone else, they can not then divorce that new spouse and then come back to the old spouse. You get that? That's an abomination. God says, no, 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 that doesn't work. That's an abomination. That's a sin. That's disgusting. And he's saying the same thing now. You are... What? Once married to Satan, you divorce Satan because sin died, remember Romans, and now you're married to Christ. You're married to Christ, you leave Christ, and you go back to Satan, you go back to your dead husband. God don't want you back. Get married to the husband, and you think you're going to divorce the husband uh, this time and come back to Christ? God said, no, 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 no. If I wouldn't allow you to do it, why do you think we're going to do it together? Hmm? If I didn't allow you to do it among yourself in your sinful state, why do you think I'm going to do it to you in all righteousness and holiness? Okay, Hebrews chapter 10, time verse 23, and we're going to read up to 39, but I'm going to stop you a couple of times just to emphasize certain things in this passage. Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Hold, Not hold on before you go any further. When he says, yeah, let us hold fast, a profession of a face without, without waver. God hates double-minded people. He hates, he hates you being tossed to and fro by every single wave of doctrine. He hates that. He hates wishy-washy people. Okay? 
Oh yeah, God does hate certain things. Go read your Bible. But here's something that Jesus said pertaining to this first verse. In Luke 9 verse 62, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. He says, Folks, one of the things that Jesus himself told us, he says, listen, if you're going to build a tower, first sit down and count the cost. Because you don't want it to happen that you don't have enough money to finish and then everybody start laughing at you. Hey, look at him. He start building that tower and now he's flat broke and the tower is half built. He's saying, he wasn't telling the people about architecture and building planning. What he was saying is that before you come and follow me, sit down, count the cost. Okay, because once you put your hand to the plow, if you look back, if you go back, you're not fit for heaven. Lot's wife. Okay, well, that's a good example. All right, so continue now. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Okay, hold on. He's saying that if we sin willfully after we have come to the knowledge of the truth, no more sacrifice. Why is that sacrifice necessary for the forgiveness of sin? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. The way that we our sins are forgiven is that when we go to God, Right? Remember? When God first showed you your, your sinfulness, what happened was that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, His blood, washed away our sins. I know this Bible now is telling us in Hebrews that if we willfully, if we sin willfully, we sit down, we plan it, and we say, God will forgive me. And mm -hmm. then we go sin. God is saying, no. But hold on. He says that you remember when I told you, Jesus had said that it was impossible for the, the elect to be deceived. And he had given us a prescription. And he had said, how you avoid this is do what? When they said, I'm in the wilderness, don't go. When I say, I'm in the secret chamber, don't go. Mark 24, so 24. he gave us, in that verse, he gave us an antidote for the deception. Stay off the devil's ground. Don't go. Now here he's also now giving us another prescription to how we can avoid sinning willfully. Look at the first word in verse 26. He says, for. What is the for there for? Let's find out in first. That's fine. He say, if you go back to 25, he say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much today as we see the day approaching. So much the more. So if we keep exhorting one another, what exhorting mean? To go back two more verses. Um, hmm? it, it, like it says, to, to let us consider one another, to provoke right. unto love and good works. Right. So we're what, doing what? We're considering one another in doing what? In provoking each other to love and to good works. In other words, encouraging each other to do these things. And we're encouraging each other to do the good thing, but we're also admin admonishing each other when we do the bad yeah. things. Okay? It's not one way. If you have a brother in church that only tells you the good things that you're doing, but ignore the bad things that you do, he's not your brother. God tells you that if you hate your brother, right? If you hate your brother, you will suffer sin upon him. In other words, when you hate him, you won't tell him about your sin. But if you love him, you will not sit by and watch him sin. And the verse is on the screen. Just like a parent and their child, you're not going to stand by and see your children doing something that's wrong and not stop them. Or something that's even if it's something dangerous to them temporal you, you're not going to stop by and watch them right. to do it and not stop them right. and it's the same with the with your members in the in your church because the bible says we are our members of one body are you going to watch your hand reaching to something hot and not say anything okay so what we find now is that we and we love this verse in church you know not forsaken us the assembly of ourselves together Right, we love that, but it says that the reason why we assemble together is so that we can exhort each other, so that, verse 26, we don't fall into willful sin. You see that? 
That's why we don't go and live some isolated place away from the body of Christ. We have to be in the body of Christ. So the body of Christ will protect us from willful sin. Will help to protect. Because if we fall into willful sin, here's what happened. We have no more sacrifice. No more sacrifice. But but, but it gets worse. Because 27 says, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Okay. So that's what we're going to get instead. So instead of us getting a sacrifice to cover our sin, we instead get what? Judgment, judgment and, and fiery indignation. indignation, which do what? Devour. Devour the adversary. You know what the judgment and final indignation is? We call it hell. Be careful. Go on, verse 28. He, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Okay, stop. Let me point out something to you here. It says, Of how much sore punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy. Isn't it how much sore? What does that mean? It means that Remember, Jesus said that he talked to them in, in parables. Why? Because here and they might hear and be converted. And if they are converted and then lose their salvation, you know what happened? They get a, they get a, a little heart of heart of hell. Because he who don't know will be beaten through a few stripes, but he who knows much will be beaten with many stripes. So it's in today's English that would, that means worse. Right. And um, it's a proposal, shall he be? Thought worthy, who has trodden off underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant, whereby, no, here it is, where, wherewith he was sanctified. Now, most people think that the he here is referring to Jesus. It's not. The he here is referring back to the he further up where he says, Shall he be thought worthy? Or the he that willfully sinning. Or he that willfully sinned. But, but no, notice what it says. Wherein he was sanctified. Yeah, so that's the person who, who that's a was Christian. saved. Who was that's saved. a Christian. Yeah. Most of us running around the church right now talking about sanctification as a work of a lifetime. You hear Paul is saying, no, 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 no. He was sanctified. So and done after deal. he was sanctified, he went backwards. And now the only thing that he has to look forward to in his future is fire, indignation, and judgment. He was sanctified. But he only has hell to look forward to. Because of I mean that he was saved, he was separated unto righteousness. So he has he's looking towards judgment now because he has despised the sacrifice that Jesus has made for him. Right. Dying on the no, cross. No, no, hold on, before because I don't want if you if you have committed this kind of sin that you just give up on God. Because remember, David sinned with Bathsheba. This is a sin that David committed, willful, willful sin. sin. And David's problem was that although he knew he had sinned and he was repentant, there was no repentance for him because he says in Psalms 51, I think it is, that if he had required a sacrifice, I would have given it. But there was no contingency made in the entire Bible, not in the laws of Moses, not in the sacrificial system, not in the new system, for willful sin. Willful um, what's the other word that we use um, for, for, for willful, premeditated, presumptuous, that's the word, presumptuous sin. But God, in his infinite mercy, decided to save David. So it's God's providence. It was a unilateral, it was a unilateral act of God. There was nothing else to propel God or anything to help David. God, on his own Decided, I'm going to go save you. It was not a sacrificial saving. Just mark that. After David sinned, the sacrifices that, that he offered afterwards were sacrifices of thanksgiving. So, um, in other words, what you're saying is, if one might have done this, there might still be hope if God deems it so. If God deems it so. But, okay, as a Christian, if I say... But we should not presumptuously... If, yeah, well, let me explain this. As a Christian, if I sin, a sin of ignorance, 
meaning that I didn't know what I was doing at the time I did it, then I have, and catch this word, I have a right to boldly approach the throne of God and ask for forgiveness. Because as Paul put it with his persecution of the church, he did it ignorantly. Okay? So if it's a sin that I didn't know I was doing, I basically have that right as a child of God to say, Daddy, forgive me. But it's not a sin I did that I premeditatedly and presumptuously did it, talking about God will forgive me. I, I don't have that right anymore. But we are of your pastors who keep teaching you this because when they teach you that you can always do these things and just walk back into God's, in, into God's arms, be careful. They're playing with your soul. Let's move on, baby. You were saying, but? But God has the right if he wants, if, if he chooses. If he chooses to. to if he chooses to. But, you, you know, but we shouldn't he, use that as, as a get-out-of-jail card. No, no, no. It can't be used as a get-out-of-jail card, card because we can't activate it. It's totally unilateral with God. Right. And don't think that God is this little wishy-washy person who is so much in love with you that he will so put up with, with anything that you do. That's not God. You need to read your Bible. Okay, go on. And we're verse 30. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a grazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye will receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, let me try to explain what Paul is saying here very quickly. He says, but call to remember as a former day in which after you were illuminated, after you were saved, that's what illuminated me, you're coming into the light. After you were saved, you endured all of this stuff, the persecution, the, the bad things. He says, and even some of you who didn't actually go through this, you joined yourself to other people who were going through it. That's what it meant mean. You became companions of those who were so used, used and abused. For ye had compassion of me, my bonds. He, he's explained all of the things that you're going through. And for all of this, he says, hey, do not cast away your confidence. What confidence? The confidence, the assurance that you're saved. Don't cast it away. Now that you have gone through all of that hardship, don't make this mistake and just flippantly lose it, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of Patience. Patience. You have need of patience. Be patient. Just, just, just hold on a little longer. That, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. He said, just hold on. Have some patience because you have already done the will of God. Don't lose the promise. You see that? For yet a little while, he that will come, Will not tarry. That shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Just hold on. Jesus is on his way. Now the just shall live by faith. The just shall what? Live by faith. But if the just draw back, draw back, God says, My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But Paul says, Hey, yeah. hey, 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 hey. I'm being a little harsh here because I know that we, me and you, the people he's talking to, we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Go back to their sins. Notice what it says. Who draw back unto 
perdition. Remember what perdition means? Perdition, for example, was used in Judas, the son of perdition. It is, perdition is hell. If you draw back, after you have been through all of this suffering and you draw back, you draw back, you only have one place to fall. And, it's also and used, that is hell. Also used in Thessalonians in reference to the, the man of sin. Right. He said, but, but we are of what? We are of them that believe to, to the saving of the soul. Second Peter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therewith and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. For it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So they, they might be encouraged to say that, you know, the people who backslide were not really converted in the, or were not really saved to begin with. So no, that's the, why they backslide. Some, sometimes it's true. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's true. true. Because some of these are the stony brown errors who are not really converted. That's in reference say, to the, the seed. The, this, this part of the sow and the seed. It says that they are the ones who, when they heard the word, they got excited and they accepted Jesus. But they didn't really understand what they were doing. So once affliction rose, they melted away. Okay. And also the, the ones who were... Um, the, the wayside. The strangled with the thorns. The, the ones with the thorns is who they're talking about. Right. These are the ones with the thorns. They understood. They started. They were doing well. And then life, life inter intervened and they lost their way. So these are the seed among the thorns. So it says, if they have escaped, they have done what? Escape. Escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a description of salvation. The pollution of the world is sin. Mm -hmm. It is sin that polluted the earth when Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden and sin entered the world and polluted it. But here we say that they have what? Escaped, escaped the pollution. It says, they are a... Uh, Again entangled. Again entangled therein. So they re-entered re it. And overcome. So they are neck deep in it. And this is not a casual uh, fling. Yeah, this is... This is not a Christian walking, minding his own business and trip and fall into sin. This is a Christian deciding deliberately that he's going to go jump in a sea of sin. Going he's going to go take a nice swim in sin. And it says that he was what? Overcome. overcome. But notice this. It says the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it would be better for them if they have never known what? The way of righteousness. They say they have not known the way of righteousness. Who knows the way of righteousness? The one who is saved. I think the way of righteousness is actually taken from, I think it's from the book of Ezekiel, and I looked that up. But the, righteous, the, the way of righteousness, the only the saints trod that road. Right? But they know that road because they were saved. And then after they have known it to turn from the Holy Commandments delivered unto them. Paul is saying it would have been better for them not to have known salvation, not to have known Christ, not to have known Christianity. This is what Jesus referred to when he, when he said that this is why he's speaking in parables. Right, and this is also what he explained when he talks about the, the man who was, whose heart was cleansed and the demon was cast out. And but he never invited in the Holy Spirit, and the demon went around looking for so, somewhere to live. So the man whose house was cleansed, and then not, and then the demon went away and came back and found the house empty. Right. And brought in and seven, brought in seven, seven spirits worse than he was. So the, the latter end was worse for that man than the beginning, and that is why, as I said, Jesus spoke in parables because Jesus, some of us, believe it or not. We are beyond salvation, some of us, because we refuse to believe God. And for those of us who in the deepest recesses of our heart refuse to believe God, God loves us too much for even for us to open our minds so that we understand. Because even if we understand, we're still going to reject him, reject him or ultimately, and which means that our punishment will be greater. So God in his mercy said, I'm not going to leave you open to that level of punishment. 
I'm going to make you stay right where you are so that you're burnt in a flash. All these passages that we have been looking at are speaking of the saved person and not the heathen. Go back and read them. You'll find that Paul is talking to church folks, the Christians, not the heathen. Paul and Peter. Right. The these guys were being used by God as a vessel. These guys were all talking to Christians. Look, let's look at Romans 8 verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, so look at this. People who have not known Christ, the people who have never been born again, are in the flesh, and for them it is impossible for them to obey the laws of God. So all of these things that we're looking at cannot possibly apply to them because they were never in it. You see that? God is not going to be warning the people who cannot be warned. You see that what I'm talking about here? These people cannot be warned because they are not subject to the law of God. And they can't be because they're totally flesh. So what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8 verse 6 and 7 is that these guys are outside what God is describing and what we have been going through. John 3.16. Now what we're looking at are the verses that show us that these verses cannot possibly apply to the poor people who are never saved. John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation, that light came into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Okay, so again, Jesus here, in the greatest verse in the Bible, right after it, he's explaining that, listen, John 3.16 does not apply to everybody. You see that? It doesn't apply to everybody, because what? Some of them will not believe on Jesus Christ, and those who do not believe on Jesus Christ is already condemned. He's not coming to condemn them. He's coming to save them from condemnation. They're condemning themselves. If they do not listen, then guess what? They just get what they were going to get anyway. You get that? But if they listen and come to Jesus and then crucifying to themselves a second time, then their punishment is that much greater because now they know. Okay? Luke 8, 10. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, he explained this a little, for, a, a little more broadly. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even that he hath. Therefore speak I in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecies of Elias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Okay, and this is what we had discussed earlier. 
that the parables that Jesus spoke were not as we have been told in church all the days of our lives, that Jesus spoke in parables to make things simple so okay. we could understand it. That it's a hurricane story with a heavenly meaning and you just put it in the context that we can comprehend. Here Jesus is explaining why he's using parables and he's saying he's using it so that they would not understand. And the reason why he's doing it is because if they understood and repented of their sin and he cleansed them and saved their soul, they would go right back to what they used to do, like the dog that returned to his own vomit and the pig that was washed or wallowing in the mire. You see that? Jesus said, no, I'm going to spare them that agony by speaking to them in parables. Now, those who will be saved will sit down and think about the parables and figure it out and come to be saved. Those who Christ is describing here, they'll hear the same story, but it will only remain a story with them. They won't spend another second after they hear it to think about it and to figure out how it applies to them. All it is to them is another story. They went out, they heard a great story. Yeah, they're satisfied. It's like church today. A lot of people are in the church. They're just there to be entertained. Once they leave the sanctuary, they don't hear. They don't even remember what happens in the service. So they're they're not there to hear or to be exhorted or anything. It's just entertainment. It's just another thing to do. To feel good about ourselves. No, I, I think also as we saw in Matthew thirteen, I believe. I I think this might have been right after the parable with the sower and wheat. The Bible says that those who seek God with all their hearts, with diligence, they will find him. Here, the disciples didn't understand what the parable was, and they went back to understand. They went back to ask him, hey, what are you saying? What's going on? What are you saying? So it, exactly. it, it, it also exactly. comes, comes back to the person seeking after God. You know, you're wanting to know what it means. You, you go inquire. I or you go do more studies or whatever it is. Right. That's the same thing that I see happening in church all the time. I used to see a guy talking about, man, that was a great sermon today, wasn't it? Man, that, that guy can preach. And I say to them, oh, it's a sermon. what did he talk about? And they looked at me with this blank yeah. stare. <laughs> they had no idea. They just got excited by floral words. You get me? I have had the occasions to preach, and sometimes when I preach, I knew the people that I spoke to didn't understand. Either they didn't understand or they didn't hear, because nobody came to me for clarification, and I knew that there were some things in there that I did not clarify. So if they were listening carefully, and if they were understanding, they would say, hey, what did, what you, did you mean when you said X? So there's always that built in. But what I want us to do today, because this is a heavy, heavy subject, is to think about what we have said. And when you have, th- you have thought about it and you decide that, hey, listen, I'm going to sp- stop playing this church game, this Christian game, and I'm going to commit my life to God, and I'm going to become a part of His church and be called according to His name, then here's what you do after that. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. Okay, so Paul is saying, listen, after I've done all of this, I've got to make sure that I take care of me, because I can do all of this thing that I'm doing for God and still be one of them who is cast away. Cast away is not a good phrase. Cast away means exactly what I say. Cast away into utter darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cast away means to be cast into hell. Paul is saying, after I've done all of this, I don't want myself to be cast away. So what do I do? I'm not taking this Christian walk as a joke. I'm running to win. I'm not fighting as someone who is boxing the air. I'm fighting because I know that when my opponent gets up, I'm going to knock him out. I'm not going to be the one knocked out. I'm playing this Christian game to win. So he's in it for real. Yeah, he's in it. He's in it and he's in it to win it. The greatest theologian and philosopher that America has ever produced is a guy who you probably know him from this most famous sermon that he does, the most famous American ser- sermon, which was Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And what was his name again, baby? Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. 
Jonathan Edwards said when he was 16 or 17 years old, he said that he committed to God. And he, this was a commitment he made to God. He says, I want to be the best Christian that ever lived. That was his goal. It, it might sound a little weird to us because we only apply this kind of ambition to worldly things. But he said to God, I want to be the best Christian that ever lived. And guess what? God granted his wish because he became the best theologian that America has ever produced, the best philosopher that America has ever produced. So God gave him, so far as was possible, what he asked for. He became the best Christian that has ever lived. You get that? And we can each do that. Why is it that for every area in our lives we strive to be the best, but when it comes to Christianity, we just want to be one of the crowd? Or less than medium. Let me, let me explain something <laughs> to you. There will be no common Christians in heaven. Not one. Because there's no such thing as a common Christian. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until we meet again, be well and tell somebody about Jesus. God bless him. Goodbye.